In this video, I'm gonna see how fast I can beat Pokemon Crystal with only a whooper. Rules in the description. The last Generation 2 video I did was with Slugma, and it was a pretty rough playthrough. Until the end, that is, where it got access to a cool combo of Amnesia and Curse. Now, while Wooper can use this combo, I do expect it to perform worse overall. First of all, its stats aren't as good as Slugma. I know, that is actually saying a lot. It has 55 HP, 45 attack and defense, 25 special attack and special defense, and 15 speed. Yes, this is less speed than Slugma, a Pokemon that is based on a slug. Why is Wooper slower? I don't know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Also, unfortunately for Wooper, it has significantly lower special attack. Slugma had 70 special attack, whereas Wooper has 25. That is really not going to make my water moves hit particularly hard. Luckily for it, though, its attack stat is higher, so its ground moves will hit fairly hard, I guess, in comparison. And that leads us to another reason that I think Wooper is going to perform worse, and that's the fact that it's a dual type. Despite what I thought about Slugma, it is just a mono fire type, it gets the rock type when it evolves, but Wooper starts with its ground type, and that gives it a double weakness to grass type moves. Luckily for Wooper, there aren't any prominent grass type trainers outside of Erika, and the Kanto gym leaders usually are pushovers. In the league, there are two grass types, despite what I have said in previous videos. There is the Executor on Will's team, however it doesn't know any damage dealing grass type moves, and then the Vileplume on Karen's team, which does no pedal dance. However, luckily for Wooper, the designers gave it a way to counter these moves, so let's examine its move pool. It starts with Water Gun and Tail Whip, which is decent I guess for the early game. At level 11 it learns Slam, which is its first physical move, so I can't wait until I get there. After that it gets Amnesia at 21, and then Earthquake at 31. Beyond that the moves won't be that useful, Rain Dance is like okay I guess, and Mist and Haze are probably not going to be useful at all. However, Wooper's move pool really shines when it comes to the TM and HMs it can learn. It gets access to Rollout, all three of the ground type moves, which is not the case for some Pokemon like Piloswine, which cannot learn Dig. Wooper gets access to both Ice Punch and Sludge Bomb to counter its Grass type weakness. It gets access to a fantastic same type attack bonus move in the form of Surf, which comes fairly early on in Johto playthroughs. I do find it interesting though that Wooper's only level up water type move is Water Gun. Well, I guess they're designing around the fact that the player can use Surf. After all of that, it gets access to one tutor move in the form of Ice Beam, which is a fantastic post-league upgrade to Ice Punch. Now I didn't mention the normal moves, it only gets access to two of the big three. In this case, it doesn't learn Swift, but it can learn Headbutt and Return. Alright, so there's only one last thing to talk about with Wooper. Luckily, this thing is not a slow growth rate Pokemon, it is the medium fast growth rate. That's second slowest in the early game, which is a bit annoying, but it isn't going to cause that many issues. Now I should mention the rival because today I have given him Chikorita. In all of my Johto playthroughs, I require myself to face the starter that is likely going to be the hardest against the Pokemon I am using, and believe me, Chikorita is going to be really rough for Wooper. Luckily though, not in the first fight because it doesn't have any grass type moves yet. So the first gym leader that I have to face is Faulkner, and I need a strategy for him. I think that Wooper will be able to win once it gets Slam at level 11, so I'm going to fight all of the early game trainers before Violet City. Then once I reach this location, I'm going to fight the trainers in the gym, because I do not want to go into Sprout Tower and get hit by 4 times damage from Vine Whip. Alright, so will Slam be enough for Faulkner? Let's find out. Up first he sends in Pidgey, which is not going to prioritize Mud Slap, because in this case, Tackle with the same type attack bonus is going to do more damage. Luckily for me, with 75% accuracy, Slam does hit the Pidgey twice and knocks it out, so I only sustain 3 hit points of damage before I move on to his ace. Now it's going to prioritize Gust, because this is the highest damage that it has available on its moveset, and luckily for me, it's not doing very much to Wooper, plus Slam is doing one third to the Pidgeotto. I guess I could potentially lose this fight if I miss a lot, but in this case I don't, so Wooper defeats Faulkner on its first attempt. And defeating him gives Wooper some great advantages. I get a 12.5% boost to my attack stat, plus I get the TM for Mud Slap, which is my first ground type move. On the next route of the game, I make an objective mistake. I should have fought all of the trainers here. However, I don't. That's because the rival in Azalea Town has a Bay Leaf, and it does no Razor Leaf. So we are going to see how my decision to not do this training affects me in just a few moments. However, before that, I have to make my way through Union Cave, defeat all the rockets in Slowpoke Well, and then defeat the trainers in Bugsy's Gym. At level 16, I was feeling confident, so let's see how this fight goes.
His lead Metapod is, quite frankly, never an issue. I can't imagine a single Pokémon struggling against this thing. If you can think of a Pokémon that might struggle here, please let me know in the comments. By the way, it is not Ditto, because you can just use Struggle to knock the Metapod out. However, the Kakuna that follows can be an issue. This is because it knows Poison Sting, which is much better than Metapod's Tackle. The reason is that it can poison you before the Scyther comes out, and that's exactly what happens to Wooper. So now every turn I'm going to be taking chip damage, and I need to be able to knock the Scyther out quickly, hopefully in like three turns, so that it can't stack up Fury Cutter. However, Wooper's slams, which are its best attacking move, also levering its best offensive stat, are doing less than a quarter to Scyther. After two, it is not even at half health. So I am definitely going to have to train up more for this fight. I haven't even made it to the Bayleaf yet. I have to say, after this defeat, I was feeling a bit worried. I backtrack into Union Cave, defeating some of the trainers here that I didn't fight when I first came through. After that, I fight Wild Pokémon, leveling Wooper up to level 20, and now I head back to face Bugsy again. These additional levels have given Wooper enough damage to be able to knock the Scyther out in three hits, and because of that, this fight is no longer difficult. However, with that victory, I have now earned myself the right to face the rival. Up first is Ghastly. Mudslap makes the most sense here to lower its accuracy so it's less likely to hit something like Hypnosis. However, that does allow it to use Spite, lowering Mudslap's PP. This move doesn't already have a lot, so that's a little bit unfortunate. Because it didn't deal lethal damage to the Ghastly, I have to knock it out on the next turn, and then Wooper levels up to level 21 where it can learn Amnesia. Now, I really want this on my set throughout most of the playthrough because it's going to be fantastic against Red at the very end of the game. However, it could also be useful here against the Bayleaf's Razor Leaf. Now if you're like me right now and thinking a lot about Generation 4, you might think that Razor Leaf is a physical move, but in Generation 2, all Grass-type moves are special. However, Wooper has another problem, because it is significantly slower than the Bayleaf, so Razor Leaf hits right away, and it takes Wooper out from full health. Okay, that is very bad. And please get ready to cringe because I did not save after I beat Bugsy, so I'm gonna have to defeat him for a second time. Luckily for me, Wooper has no issues doing that. So there might be a strategy that's viable that isn't just grinding up to like level 25. If I level up to level 21, then against the rival's Ghastly, I'm gonna be able to set up Amnesia. This thing only has a physical move in the form of Lick, and it has two status moves, Hypnosis and Spite. I'm not really worried about Spite when I'm spamming Amnesia, and Hypnosis is just an annoying time waste. The thing that's most worrying here is the fact that the Ghastly can paralyze Wooper. Now, I went into this with a Paralyzed Cure Berry, however, Ghastly paralyzed me on the first turn, and then its second Lick paralyzes is Wooper again. Uh, so that's some really bad luck. And it actually gets worse because I attack the Ghastly with Mud Slap, hoping to lower its accuracy so it is less likely to damage me. However, Wooper gets a critical hit, knocking it out, so now I have to move on to the Bayleaf with only plus four special defense. However, there is a problem with this Amnesia strategy, because the rival's AI is choosing his moves based on damage rolls that he calculates before he moves. As a result, his Bayleaf knows that it now cannot one-shot me, and it also can't poison me with poison powder, so it's either going to use Growl or Reflect, and in this case it chooses the latter. As a result, Slam does pathetic damage. That looks like it is about an eighth, and there is no way Wooper is going to survive eight turns in this battle, especially if the Bayleaf gets a critical hit with Razor Leaf, which is fairly common because this is a high crit chance move. I tried this strategy again so I could see what happens if Wooper was not paralyzed. What I'm going to do here instead of using Slam right away is use Mud Slap to lower Bayleaf's accuracy. However, it hits two consecutive Razor Leafs and Wooper goes down again. Obviously, what I have to do is more training. It's at this point in the run that I should compare the runs between Slugma and Wooper. When the rival has the Croconaw on his team, it only has Water Gun, which is base 40 power. Also, Croconaw has more attack than Special Attack, so this move doesn't hit that hard. However, when the rival has Bayleaf, Razor Leaf has 55 base power, and it has a high critical hit chance. Because of this fight alone, the rival's team is always the strongest when he chooses Chikorita. That's why, for example, if I'm using a normal type Pokemon, I will replace Totodile with the Pokemon that I am choosing, just so that the rival will have the hardest possible option. Now in all of my playthroughs, I am seeing how fast I can beat the game with each Pokemon. Like, believe me, it is pretty obvious that every Pokemon can beat the game. There are only like one or two Pokemon that I'm like, probably not. Like, 
Caterpie, for example. This thing is just trash and it doesn't get any TM and HM moves. Also, I thought that Ditto wasn't going to be able to beat the game, and I actually made a video where I wasn't able to beat the game. However, then more information came to the surface, and uh, yeah, you should check out this video if you haven't seen it already. So for these playthroughs, I'm trying to see how fast the Pokémon can beat the game, and then rank them at the end. To make these comparisons as fair as is possible, I'm always playing with Pokémon that have perfect IVs, or as close to perfect as is possible to give me an optimal hidden power. Here, I will expose what might be considered a flaw in my methodology, which is the fact that the rival has the strongest team against my Pokemon, meaning that sometimes Bayleaf is going to be the Pokemon I'm facing. It will always be easier to defeat the rival when he has Croconaw or he has Quilava. However, personally, I think that this is ranking Pokemon in the spirit of the game, because the rival is supposed to choose the starter that is strong against yours. For example, in the distant future, when I end up playing the later Pokemon games, I will be giving the rival the starter that is weak against my starter, because that seems to be the new convention that these games are taking. Honestly, I don't really like it though, I prefer the rival being a challenging threat throughout the game. Alright, so at level 23, let's head back to the rival and see if this is now possible. My first battle against him, Wooper gets paralyzed before the Bayleaf, Razorleaf misses. Looks like I'm doing about a quarter now, which is encouraging. However, remember that Slam can also miss, so its accuracy gives me another loss. In the next battle, I experimented with a slightly different strategy. What if I just use Mudslap to knock the Ghastly out so that I have no chance of getting paralyzed? And then against the Bayleaf, I am hoping that it will survive one Razor Leaf. That will allow it to use a setup move on the first turn and allow Wooper to start using Mudslap, lowering its accuracy. This is exactly what happens. The Bayleaf goes for Growl, which is perfect. However, Razor Leaf hits on the next turn, taking Wooper down to red health. So I do survive one that is not a critical hit, but that is still not enough to give me a victory. Okay, it is time to head back to the cave and do more training. Ugh. By the way, grinding in Johto games is probably my least favorite thing to do in all of the challenges that I do on my channel. There is nothing in Generation 1 or in Generation 3 that gets to this level of tedium. And that is saying a lot because in Generation 2 there is the Rocket plotline, which is uh, my second least favorite area. Yeah, I am now realizing that Wooper is going to make me very frustrated by the end of this video. At level 25, with almost 40 minutes on the clock, I come back to the rival to try again. And then immediately, the Bayleaf crits me with Razor Leaf, giving Wooper another loss. It was at this point that I realized that training is essentially doing nothing. I have to luck my way through this battle. If the Bayleaf crits me, I am going to lose, so I should just rely on Mud Slap and hopefully get a victory soon. Honestly, having 5 to 10 more resets here is probably going to be faster than leveling up to like 28 or 30. And by the way, I was right, because in the very next fight, I finally defeat the Bayleaf. Because of the grinding I've done, I now outspeed the Zubat. However, Slam misses, which is terrifying because it could use Supersonic. However, it just goes for Bite, doing 2 damage. Okay, Slam misses again. Okay, Zubat goes for Bite, that's good. And then, third time's the charm, Slam hits and knocks the Zubat out. Okay, so at long last, I have defeated the rival in Azalea Town, and Wooper is moving on to the forest, which is perfect, because now I get a big moveset upgrade. Despite Slam having more power than Headbutt, it is by no means better, because Headbutt has 100% accuracy and a 30% chance to flinch. Now the moveset upgrades are going to continue in rapid fire, because in the Goldenrod department store, there are some of the most broken TMs from any generation of Pokemon. Here I can buy TM33, which is Ice Punch, and teach it to Wooper immediately. Now you might think that dropping Mud Slap right now is a mistake, however, I'm doing that intentionally, because once I reach the National Park, I can pick up the TM for Dig, which is a much better same type attack bonus move. And it's also the perfect move against Whitney, because it can be used to break Rollout's combo. And with it, I am ready to take her on. Of all of the major battles that I have had so far, I think that this one has the highest likelihood to be easy. I'm outspeeding the Clefairy, so it's probably going to be no problems as long as it doesn't metronome a grass type move. In this case, it gets Crab Hammer, which actually does decent damage, and then I knock it out on the second turn. Okay, so it is time for the Mill Tank. It starts using Rollout, but every turn it chooses this move, I can just go for Dig break the combo, and deal significant damage. As a result, Wooper is easily able to take the mill tank out and earn itself the third badge. Heading north to Acritique City, I pick up the TM for Rollout. This could be useful later on. However, it is not one of my favorite moves since it locks you into using it. After that, I take on Sudowoodo, which is easy to finish off because I have Dig. And then in Acritique City, I defeat all of the Kimono Girls, earning myself the HM for Surf. 
Here I had a little bit of a conundrum. I don't really want to give up any of the moves that I currently have. Dig is a fantastic move for Morty. Amnesia I need to save for the late game. Need I remind you that there is no move reminder in Generation 2. Ice Punch gives Wooper coverage against grass types, and Headbutt is a fantastic move when all of the other moves are not good choices. My standard routing in this portion of the game is to head to the lighthouse first before taking on any other major battles. This allows me to fight mandatory trainers now, and then use an escape rope and teleport to get back to Ecrity city. Overall, it doesn't waste very much time, and it makes it more likely that I'm going to defeat the rival in Burn Tower when I have to take him on. He leads with Haunter. Now Dig is fantastic against it, however it's faster, and it puts a curse on Wooper, which now makes using Dig very bad. However, that's not a problem because Wooper levels up to level 31, where I can learn Earthquake. Next, the rival sends in Bayleaf. I didn't mention it, I have picked up the Quick Claw. It does not activate here. Bayleaf connects with Razorleaf, gets a critical hit, and knocks Wooper out. So I took curse damage on one turn because I didn't know Earthquake to use against the Haunter on turn one. To prepare to face the rival again, I level up to 31 so they have this move from the start of the fight. Now I can knock the Haunter out and take no curse damage on the first turn because in generation two, it only deals damage to you if the opponent's Pokemon does not faint. Bayleaf comes out, hits Razor Leaf, which Wooper survives on orange health. Ice Punch does half. I take curse damage, surviving on three hit points, and now I need the Quick Claw to come through for me. And in this case, it does. So Wooper finishes the Bayleaf off. And from there, this fight is going to be trivial. I outspeed both the Zubat and the Magnemite, and I have super effective damage against both of them. With the third rival defeated, I am now ready for Morty. Okay, so there are some unfortunate numbers to go through for this battle. Wooper is slower than all of his Pokemon. Yes, even the first Ghastly. It has three more speed. That allows it to set up Curse right away on the first turn. In this case, if Earthquake does not KO any of his Pokemon, I am going to be taking some damage. And here I want to note that I took the Quick Claw into the battle, because I thought that moving first was going to be overall more important. However, it would have been nice if I had got it against the first two Pokemon, so that I wasn't cursed. However, I am able to knock the first Haunter out without getting hit by something like Hypnosis. And then Morty's AI makes a choice that I have very rarely seen. He sends out his second Haunter before the Gengar. If you know why he did this, let me know in the comments. My hypothesis here is that he's trying to prioritize Spite to lower Earthquake's PP before he sends his ace Gengar in. It doesn't work out for him in this case. The Quick Claw activates against Gengar, I hit Earthquake, and knock it out with a single hit. In this playthrough, I'm going to take the conventional approach and head to Chuck next. I don't have a type disadvantage against him, plus I think that Earthquake is going to be enough to defeat his Pokemon. Taking him on before Jasmine or Price gives me access to Fly, which is really going to speed up my mid-game routing, as well as giving me access to more held items. Inside of Chuck's gym, there's usually some notable trainers, but Wooper just stomps all of them, and I make it to the gym leader, so let's take him on. Up first is Primeape. It is faster than Wooper, significantly so by 20 speed. It goes for Leer on the first turn, lowering my defense, Earthquake hits, and just barely doesn't get the knockout. Alright, that's a bit annoying, so I take some chip damage from Fury Swipes, which hits three times before I knock the Primeape out. Okay, so now it's time for the Polyrath, which is also faster than Wooper. Luckily though, it just misses a Dynamic Punch and I hit my first Earthquake, which does less than half. Alright, that's not good. Dynamic Punch hits this time, which I guess is fair. It takes Wooper all the way down to red health, also causing confusion, and in this case, Wooper does self-inflicted damage, which finishes the fight. I tried the fight again to see if maybe I have a better damage range against the Primeape, and the answer is no, it still survives. Against the Polyrath, I also thought maybe there is the chance that I'm gonna get a two hit, but in this case, it just barely survives on red health, and this time the fight ends with a second Dynamic Punch. I didn't yet fight all of the trainers at sea, so I can do that now to give Wooper more experience and level it all the way up to level 40. This is over two more damage rounding thresholds, and while I don't have the outspeeds on Chuck's Pokemon, I should now get the one hit on the Primeape. And uh, unfortunately for me, I went into this fight and I have no PP left on Earthquake after all my training, so yeah, this one is a loss that's totally just human error, my bad. However, when I actually do use Earthquake, it does knock the Primeape out in a single hit, so that's really encouraging. Then against the Polyrath, I do more than half. It uses Hypnosis, but my Mint Berry cures it, and finally I've defeated Chuck. Although I do have to say that that was pretty rough. However, not as rough as with Slugma. So far, after Azalea Town, Wooper is not that bad. 
And things are about to get easier in this playthrough because now I can collect some held items. I grabbed the Mystic Water first, which is not actually going to end up being that useful because I'm not using Surf with Wooper just because of its higher attack stat. After that, I grabbed the Pink Bow. I'm sure Return is going to see use during this playthrough. However, the most important held item that I can pick up here is the Soft Sand on this little hidden area south of Goldenrod City. With those errands out of the way, I head to the Lake of Rage where I have to face the Red Gyarados. There are only three ways to end this battle. Defeat it, catch it, or use a Poké Doll to escape the battle. You cannot just use the run command to escape. So for solo challenges like this where items are banned during battle, I have to defeat it. Obviously in this case, Headbutt is going to be the move that deals the most damage to it. However, Gyarados is doing a lot of damage with each one of its thrashes. It takes Wooper to red health, and luckily my third Headbutt knocks it out. However, that fight was really close. <laughs> it is not a good sign when the red Gyarados is causing you problems. It really isn't very good. However, with it out of the way, things are going to get easier once once again, because coming up are two gym leaders which will not be a challenge for Wooper at all. First we have Price. The Ice type is super effective against the Ground type, but the Water type resists it, so all of his Pokemon are going to be dealing neutral damage to Wooper. I do want to point out here that the developers thought it was a good idea to give the Water types no Water type moves, and the Piloswine no Ground type moves. I feel like Price would be much better if his Pokemon just had better coverage moves. They have the typings to allow for it, but I can see why the developers maybe thought he should be themed around Ice. Wooper takes about a quarter in damage before I defeat the Piloswine and move on to Jasmine. Now in a significant number of my playthroughs in Johto, she is one of the hardest gym leaders in the entire game, if not the hardest gym leader. I don't really think there's another contestant for hardest gym leader, like perhaps Whitney or maybe Chuck. Morty is annoying sometimes if you're a normal type Pokemon, you don't have good coverage moves, and Claire can be awful if you don't have a solution for the dragon errors. However, if you are at a disadvantage, it always feels easier to get by those trainers than it does to get by Jasmine. However, today I have no disadvantage advantage at all. This is going to be a really easy fight. I do want to point out one thing here. The Steelix knows Sunny Day. A lot of people point out that this doesn't make a lot of sense. However, it has this specifically to counter water types so that water moves deal less damage to it. I think this is an interesting fact, but today it's not going to help it out at all because once again, my Wooper is not using Surf. I knock it out with two uses of Earthquake, move on to her final Magnemite, which I one-shot, and now I have earned myself the seventh badge. With it, I have completed all of my badge boosts, and I've now earned myself access to the rocket portion of the game. My favorite, this is going to be just so much fun. And because I don't want to subject all of you to the tedium, let's jump ahead to the rival battle in the underground, because this one is also going to be fun. Golbat comes out right away, uses Confuse Ray, Wooper hits itself, takes wing attack damage, hits itself again, more wing attack damage, finally hits Ice Punch, but it doesn't get the knockout. Yeah, Wooper's special attack is really bad. I take more wing attack damage, and by the time the Golbat goes down, I only have orange health left over when Meganium comes out. Okay, so I really don't like my chances in this fight. Meganium is faster than Wooper, it goes for Razor Leaf, and that's it. Okay, so maybe if I don't get completely trash luck against the Golbat, I'll be able to defeat the Meganium, and uh, I get trash luck against the Golbat again. It's actually even worse this time. It takes me down to 15 hit points, and then Meganium just finishes me off with a critical hit Razor Leaf. It is truly rare for a playthrough to struggle against the rival in the underground. By this point in the game, you're usually so overleveled that this fight is trivial. In my next battle, I get the luck I need to arrive at the Meganium with green health. This causes it to use poison powder instead of attacking on the first turn, and then I survive its razor leaf and knock it out for the first time. However, the Sneasel that follows is very fast, and so it's dealing chip damage to Wooper and is able to take me out before I finish it off. At this point, I decided I needed to go do some more training. By the way, there are trainers that appear at the Lake of Rage after you finish the rocket plotline in Mahogany Town, so I can fight them now for some additional experience. While I do that, I want to talk about one potential alternative to defeat the Golbat at the beginning of the fight. You might be thinking that using Ice Punch against it isn't the best choice. Maybe I could teach Return over Headbutt, and then use a physical move to deal damage to it instead, hopefully dealing more by leveraging Wooper's higher attack stat. Now when I do these playthroughs, I use a software called RBYXP Rooter, which logs all of the actions I take in the game so that I can go back and calculate damages later on to give you a little bit more perspective on my playthrough. After all, 
I think answering questions like these after the fact is very interesting, and I don't want to have that data lost forever. So with a level 47, Wooper would return, deal more damage to the Golbat. By the way, at this point in the playthrough, Wooper has maxed friendship, and even with it, return is not doing more damage to the Golbat than Ice Punch is. So because of the secondary freeze chance, Ice Punch is the best move. After finishing off all the trainers at the Lake of Rage, I go back to the radio tower to fight some of the rockets that I skipped here. And unfortunately for Wooper, it is sort of running into the Johto experience curse now, because it only leveled up from 47 to 48 after beating all of those trainers. This is a symptom of the fact that all of the trainers in Johto just have really underleveled Pokemon. I figured that I should go back and face the rival, after all, I've devised a new strategy against him. On the first turn of the battle, I can counter Confuse Ray by using a Bitter Berry. After that, I can set up Amnesia, so the Meganium will deal less damage with Razor Leaf, and the Sneasel will also deal less damage with Faint Attack. The Golbat is once again frustrating. It confuses me right before I knock it out, so now I have to roll the dice against Meganium. It uses Poison Powder, Wooper hits itself, takes Poison Damage, Razor Leaf misses, Wooper hits Ice Punch, and gets a critical hit, knocking it out in a single turn. Okay, so that was really lucky, but I'll take it. Sneasel does chip damage with Quick Attack, I finish it off with Earthquake, and from there, things should be easier. I outspeed the Magnemite, knocking it out with a single hit. Haunter comes out, uses Shadow Ball, Wooper survives, and I finally take the victory. This win grants me access to the department store where I buy three calcium. These are good in generation two because they raise both your special attack and your special defense. By the way, zinc was introduced in generation three. All right, so let's head up to the second portion of Radio Tower and defeat the rocket executives here. By the way, I basically never talk about these trainers, so I might as well just go through what their teams are. The first one is a female executive. She has an Arbok, a Vileplume, and a Murkrow. Unfortunately for me, the Arbok is faster than Wooper by one speed. That allows it to use Glare on the first turn, further cutting my speed stat. Then Vileplume goes first using Absorb, which does four times damage, and it actually does quite a bit. Do note that my Wooper is level 51, and the Vileplume is level 32. However, because I'm paralyzed, it gets a second Absorb in, and this one gets a critical hit, taking Wooper down to red health. Luckily for me, my next Ice Punch gets the KO, but there is still a Murkrow. Obviously, it's faster, it hits Wooper with Pursuit, and finishes it off. Uh, I think this is the first time I have ever lost to this rocket executive. The thing is, this fight isn't going to be a problem because the rocket is just choosing random moves, so the Arbok uses Wrap in the next battle and I finish it with Earthquake. Because of the status condition, I'm not going to have problems here, so I move on to the second rocket executive. Normally, I consider him to be slightly more challenging, especially if you have a psychic type Pokemon because he does have two dark types. By the way, I am currently planning a series with baby Pokemon, and I'm a little bit worried for how Smoochum is going to do during this fight. Houndoom is like the ultimate counter to Smoochum. Fire moves are super effective against the ice type, and dark moves are super effective against the psychic type, plus the psychic type has no effect on fire types, and starting in generation 2, the ice type is resisted by the fire type. So I uh, guess Smoochum is going to be using physical moves here, and uh, its attack stat is not very good. Anyways, that pain is for a later video. For now, let's continue with Wooper. In Ice Path, I pick up the Nevermelt Ice to boost the power of Ice Punch, and this is going to be useful immediately for Claire. This fight feels very binary. If you are able to one-hit the Dragonairs, it is not going to be a problem, but if you aren't able to one-hit the Dragonairs, it probably is going to be a problem. However, Wooper does have another advantage here, because the primary reason this fight is so difficult is because the Dragonairs use Thunder Wave to paralyze you before the Kingdra comes out. But Wooper's ground typing completely counters that strategy. It is worth noting the Dragonairs can paralyze with Dragon Breath still. However, Ice Punch one-hits the first one, which is perfect. Now, Wooper is slower than the second, one so it gets another chance to use Dragon Breath, no paralysis this time. However, Ice Punch then fails the one hit, Dragoner uses Dragon Breath again, Wooper survives, again no paralysis, and Ice Punch finishes it off. Now I've been making a big deal about avoiding paralysis here, which by the way I do not do on the final Dragonair. However, I should also mention the fact that this chip damage is really stacking up, and I'm just not going to have very much health left over for the Kingdra. However, due to paralysis preventing a move and the third Dragonair surviving an Ice Punch, it's able to finish me off with Dragon Breath so I don't even make it to her ace. Okay, so in this case, let's test Earthquake instead of using Ice Punch. After all, Ice Punch's effective power is not actually that much higher than Earthquake's effective power. Unfortunately, 
unfortunately for me in this battle, I get paralyzed on the very first turn. I really should have a paralyzed Curberry. Instead, I have the Never Melt Ice. However, Wooper still moves, hits Earthquake, and it finishes Dragonair off. All right, I'm pretty sure that is going to be a guaranteed one hit. And in this case, it is. I finish the second Dragonair off. However, then on the third one, Paralysis really messes me up. While I do finish it off, I only have 18 health left over for the Kingdra, so this is another loss. I honestly don't know what I was thinking here. I gave Wooper the Soft Sand. Like, I need a Paralyzed Cureberry or the Quick Claw. Those are the two items that would be better in this fight. Anyways, I get paralyzed right away. However, I do manage to make it to the Kingdra with significantly more health than I had last time. If I'm able to survive its surf, I'll at least get an idea for what the damage range on Earthquake is. And uh, I'm actually not going to get an idea for that because Wooper gets a critical hit and knocks the Kingdra out in a single turn. So let's go back and post and review that damage range. Wooper was dealing between 63 and 75% damage with every Earthquake. The only way it would knock the Kingdra out is by getting a critical hit. So once again, just like the rival in the underground, Wooper is making it by these major battles with only luck. It really seems like the game is trying to give Wooper a faster finish than it should have. However, don't worry, I'm about to come in here with one of the biggest mistakes in the playthrough and give Wooper a lot of extra time. Let's examine exactly what happened. So first of all, I go through all of Johto, picking up some extra rare candies and stuff like that. I always do this before I head to the league, just in case I need those rare candies to defeat a trainer like Karen or Lance. Now while we watch footage of me picking up these items, I want to mention two things. The first one is my method to choose where I save in these playthroughs. Mostly I save before major battles, before the league, and before some key trainers which usually cause problems. For instance, like Hiker Anthony. In first playthroughs, I very rarely skip any of these saves because I want to be as safe as is possible. However, in second playthroughs, I try to skip saves to get the lowest possible time. Okay, so now let's move on to point number two. I present these playthroughs as they occur when I film them. That means that I'm not trying to distract away from the mistakes that I am making. In many cases, I try to draw your attention to the mistakes that I make, specifically so that you can use your own judgment to see how you think the Pokemon really did. For example, if I'm making key strategic errors with a Pokemon, then you can evaluate it, do your own run, and see if you can get a better time with a more optimal strategy. I think overall, this is the best approach. I'm trying to model this process off of science, where, for example, a paper is peer-reviewed by a bunch of other scientists, and then people come to a conclusion about it, and then if verified, the wider scientific culture is able to benefit from that knowledge. So, what terrible mistake did I make? I think if you know Generation 2, you can probably anticipate it. Just outside of Tojo Falls, there is this spinning trainer. I would say like 1 in 10 playthroughs she catches me, however in this case, I just like sit there for an extra second without pressing down, and she catches me. Honestly, it's pretty unfortunate because the last time I saved was before Claire. Now her team is incredibly terrifying for Wooper because she has three grass types, Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, and Venusaur. Now the first two should be no problems because Ice Punch is going to get one hits against them. However, the Venusaur is probably going to survive. Ice Punch takes it to red, Venusaur uses Sleep Powder, Wooper stays asleep, giving Venusaur the time it needs to hit two Razor Leafs and finish me off. This is obviously a huge error. Now, it would be a major time loss to reset here, and I would also be stuck before Claire, potentially without a way to defeat the Kingdra easily. And I am really happy to report that in this case, I remembered not to reset, and instead, I just let my HM users faint so that I could retain all of the items and the time that I had already invested to this point. However, there is still going to be time lost here because I have to journey back to the trainer. By the way, this time I did fight her again because I really wanted revenge. In this case, I figured that Earthquake doing neutral damage with the Soft Sand was going to do significantly more damage than Ice Punch. And in this case, I was very right. I one-hit the Venusaur, taking an easy victory. Unfortunately though, Wooper is not past all of the good grass types yet, because I still have to battle the rival before the league. This time he leads with Sneasel, which is actually quite bad for Wooper, because he's able to move first using Screech, lowering my defense. This is going to be relevant later. Next, the rival chooses to send in Meganium, which fails a Poison Powder. Then it goes for Razor Leaf, which doesn't crit, so Wooper survives, and I finish it off. However, remember the Screech from the beginning of the battle? Yeah, it's going to give Golbat more damage with its wing attack, and as a result, after it survives my return, it's able to knock Wooper out. Now in the next battle, I actually luck through the fight because I freeze the Meganium with my first hit, so it does no damage with Razor Leaf. I figured that this was essentially just going to be a free win after that. However, then I get bad luck with Confusion, and I get taken down to Orange Health before knocking the Golbat out. Kadabra sets up Future Sight, which is actually bad when I'm confused and I'm taking time to defeat his Pokemon, 
Pokemon. I do make it to the Haunter, but then Future Sight deals damage and Wooper goes down. By the way, I think that is my first loss to Future Sight. There are a lot of firsts in this run, by the way, and all of them are bad. After losing to a Razor Leaf crit, I decided that I needed to train more. I think using rare candies here would be a little bit premature, especially for a first playthrough. Plus, just south of Victory Road, there is this fantastic patch of grass where Wooper is able to defeat all of the Pokemon fairly quickly. Plus, there are some fully evolved Pokemon like Sandslash and Arbok here, which give good experience heals. Beside this patch, there is also a house with a woman inside it who will heal your Pokemon. So I can train her as long as I want without having to backtrack to a Pokemon Center. At level 60, I head back to the rival to face him again. This time I'm using the Quick Claw because I fear moving first against some of his Pokemon is just going to give me a little bit more consistency. It's also worth noting at this level I am now speed tied with the Meganium and that makes it a lot more consistent. So I am finally able to defeat him and move on to the league. First up is Will. Wooper has an issue here because it is outsped by three of his Pokemon, both Zatu and the Jinx. In this case, the first portion of the fight is quite bad for me. The Zatu confuses Wooper, it hits itself, I take psychic damage, and I actually don't even make it past his first Pokemon. This is really not a good start to the league. Will is usually a pushover. I tried again. By the way, I'm using the Quick Claw, but I think the Bitterberry would be the better held item here. However, it doesn't really matter. The Zatu isn't a one-hit range. I don't outspeed it. It's gonna get a Psychic in, and from there, things are just not looking good for Wooper. It takes a lot of damage from the subsequent Pokémon, and once again goes down. One way that I can improve this battle is leveling up to 63, where hopefully I will sometimes have a one-hit range on the lead Zatu. That way, it's not gonna get a Psychic in. Once again, please remember that training in Johto takes a long time. However, it isn't as slow as it could be with Wooper, just because it has super effective damage against all of the Pokémon that appear in Victory Road. At level 63, I decided to try a different strategy against Will, which is to set up Amnesia on the first turn, just so I'm taking less damage throughout the entire fight. After that, I realized that unfortunately Return is not going to one-hit the Zatu. I don't even think I have a role for that. However, I am taking significantly less damage, so now let's play better against the Executor. I used a bad move on it last time. But even when using Ice Punch, I do not get the one hit. That allows it to use Leech Seed, which applies chip damage to me for the rest of the fight. And as a result, Wooper just barely does not make it past the final Zatu. It uses Psychic, taking Wooper down to one hit point, Return does not KO, and Leech Seed finishes me off. With how this playthrough was going so far, I did not think that it was the right time to use rare candies. Instead, I go back to Victory Road and continue the grind. While I do that, let's compare some benchmarks. So first of all, let's compare Wooper to Natu. If you haven't seen that playthrough, I'm gonna spoil it, so jump ahead to this timecode if you don't want to hear these results. Okay, so remember that Natu had to use physical moves throughout the entire Johto section of the game, and that made its playthrough quite painful and slow. How However, in its first playthrough around this time, it was beating Brock. Yes, it had made it all the way through the league and was over halfway through Kanto. In my first playthrough with Smeargle, it had beaten Lance by this point, and now I think we should compare Wooper's current time in its first playthrough with final playthrough times. Yeah, all of the E tier placements, Gligar, Natu, Smeargle, Slugma, and Coughing are around this time code. I'm thinking that Wooper might be destined for the F tier. I think with a second playthrough, Wooper is probably going to be saved from the Bruno tier, so poor Pineco will likely remain there all by itself. However, in my first playthrough, I was pretty sure that I wasn't going to finish under the 3 hour mark, at least at this rate. At level 65, the speed matchups have still not changed against Will. I would probably need to be around level 70 to outspeed the first Zatu, maybe the Jinx, but likely not the second Zatu. This time, as you can see, I am trying a different strategy, which is just to fully set up Amnesia. However, this isn't particularly good if my Pokémon does not have Rest on its moveset, because Wooper takes so much damage as I'm setting up that it only has 3 HP left over for the rest of the fight. Now, while I am able to one-hit Executor with Ice Punch, the Jinx just comes out, uses Psychic, and Wooper faints. I tried one more time, hoping that I would get lucky with Confusion Luck and not hit myself at all, but it doesn't play out well for me and Wooper goes down once again. Then I decided to only set up to plus 4 with Amnesia, but this still does not give Wooper the win. Confusion messes me up against Executor, and I go all the way down to red health on it, so once again the Jinx gets the final hit in.
I think that it is now time to change my moveset. To do this, I have to go back to Johto. By the way, this little guy standing here with his Abra will teleport you back to New Bark Town. It's a really convenient way to get back to Johto. By the way, he is removed after you defeat Lance. I don't know why, it's kind of a strange choice. It would have been nice to always have this method for fast travel. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to head to the department store and pick up another TM for Ice Punch. This allows me to put Rest in its place, and then I'll be able to teach it again to Wooper before Lance. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to use Return and Earthquake throughout the rest of the league, and I really don't want to have Wooper unlearn Amnesia because it won't be able to get it back. Amnesia in combination with Rest makes Will significantly easier. However, it is still not a free win because Confusion can mess me up, plus Psychic can lower my special defense, requiring me to set up more. And the longer I stay in the battle, the more likely it is that Will is going to score a critical hit. Things actually get really close against the Jinx because it moves first, uses Lovely Kiss, and because this isn't Rest Sleep, I am not going to wake up in a predictable number of turns. Luckily for me, Wooper wakes up right as it hits Red Health, and I am able to heal. From there, I finish the Jinx off for the very first time and move on to the Slowbro. Earthquake does more than half, it sets up Amnesia, which is absolutely useless, and I finish it off. So, I have made it to his final Zatu. Is this gonna be the fight? Well, Confusion might have something to say about that. Luckily, I hit Return, it takes the Zatu down to a sliver of health, Will uses a Max Potion, Wooper hits itself, Will uses Psychic, Wooper hits return, getting a much worse roll actually. The Zatu survives with high red health this time, but luckily for me, I get another hit in because he used a potion, and finally Will is defeated. With him out of the way, Koga is going to be much easier because he is a poison type specialist and I have Earthquake. The Fortress survives a single hit, but I take it out with a second Earthquake, and then the Crobat gets a bit annoying using Double Team. This can get really bad if it uses Toxic, which it ends up doing. However, I get lucky with Return before the Toxic counter stacks up too much, and I finish his Ace off. All that's left is Muck, it takes super effective damage from Earthquake, and I finish it in a single hit. Against Bruno, Wooper has a kind of bad matchup. It takes damage from Hitmonlee because it outspeeds. Then Hitmonchan has Mock Punch, which is priority, so it's also able to do chip damage. And after that, the Machamp survives an Earthquake and hits Cross Chop. However, Wooper pulls through, and as a result, it easily polishes off Onyx. And with Bruno out of the way, we have made it to the hardest trainer in the Elite Four. Let's take on Karen. How is she going to be for Wooper? I expect quite bad. Luckily for me though, Earthquake is doing more than half to the Umbreon, but this is not going to prevent it from using Sand Attack and lowering my accuracy. This fight always feels like I'm playing with one hand tied behind my back. To make matters even worse, I miss on the Vile Plume and it paralyzes Wooper. This allows it to hit with Petal Dance for 4 times damage. However, Wooper actually survives. I really wasn't expecting that, however this fight is definitely over anyways. Alright, let's try that again. Things start the same way. I make it back to the Vile Plume with minus one accuracy. However, this time Earthquake does hit. However, Vile Plume survives with a sliver of health and once again paralyzes Wooper. That damage range is really not encouraging. However, because Vile Plume is at such low health, it goes for Moonlight, which is really not a good idea, so I do finish it on the next turn. Murkrow's next. This thing is quite weak. Paralysis prevents one move. I take chip damage from Faint Attack and finish it on the next turn. Okay, time for Karen's Ace, Houndoom, but Earthquake is super effective here, finishing it in a single hit. Okay, so I made it to the Gengar. This might be possible. The Quick Claw activates, Wooper moves, hitting Earthquake, and Gengar goes down. All right, that was pretty lucky, but I've still made it to the champion. Let's take Lance on. By the way, I just want to point out that Lance's trainer intro is one of my favorite that we have on the entire channel. So yeah, if you haven't looked at it before, check it out now. I, I think you'll be impressed. Lance leads with Gyarados. Now there's a weird AI interaction here. I think it is not setting up Rain Dance because it sees that I am also a water type, so it doesn't want to give me the boost as well. That's quite bad for Wooper because then it gets a Surf in and a Hyper Beam in before I knock it out with two uses of Return. However, I think I can still win here because Ice Punch is very good against all of the Dragonites. However, they are faster than Wooper by only 6 speed. Ice Punch does have enough damage to knock them out in a single hit. The second one misses a Blizzard, which is very convenient, and then Lance sends in his Ace Dragonite. However, it moves first and finishes Wooper off with Outrage. The obvious update to the strategy here is to set up Amnesia against Gyarados so that it only uses Flail or Hyper Beam, then I can recover using Rest until I have good green health and finish the Gyarados off. 
My plan here was then to survive the final Dragonite's outrage, however the first two Dragonites are just doing too much damage with Hyper Beam, so I arrive here with such little health, the Dragonite outspeeds me, and Wooper once again goes down. Okay, so I could try this fight over and over and over again and hope for better luck, or I could try to stall out one of the Dragonites until it runs out of Hyper Beam. However, I'm not sure I like that strategy because it opens myself up to a lot of critical hits, and if I lose a fight after investing a ton of time into it, then the reset will be extremely painful. So in this case, I made a decision to use Rare Candies until I outspeed the first two Dragonites. This costs me a total of 6, which is a bit unfortunate, now I'm going to be a lower level for red, but Wooper is level 73 and Amnesia with Curse are just broken together, so I'm pretty confident there, I just need to make it through Lance now. Outspeeding allows me to easily sweep through his first 3 Pokemon and make it to the final Dragonite with green health. This trivializes it because Ice Punch gets the 1 hit, so Lance only has 2 Pokemon left. You'd think that Charizard would not be a threat because of the type matchup here, however it is able to do quite a bit of damage with Slash in combination with Hyper Beam, but Wooper still has half health left over for the Aerodactyl, and this is Lance's final Pokemon. Plus, I resist its most powerful move, Rock Slide. Hyper Beam is obviously quite good, but it takes two turns, so I don't consider it better than Rock Slide, plus the flinch chance is quite good. In this case though, Wooper just has enough health to survive, and it finishes the Aerodactyl off. Alright, so I've defeated the champion just under 2 hours and 20 minutes. This run has been an absolute slog. And now, it is time to head to Kanto, where waiting for me is the Grass-type gym leader. I think that it is fair to criticize my play here because I didn't have to fight her first. However, I fight her first in all my playthroughs, and it's just sort of ingrained in me. I didn't even think about it, I just walked over here. I figured that Ice Punch would be enough to defeat all of her Pokémon. After all, the Cantonian gym leaders are pretty bad. And uh, yeah, that is the case here. Ice Punch gets a series of three one-hits, so I make it all the way to her Ace Blossom without taking any damage. Now unfortunately for me, Ice Punch does not do enough to knock it out. However, However, it goes for Solar Beam taking an energy, which allows me to finish it off. So no losses for Wooper against the Grass-type specialist. However, I do need to show you the fight against Misty. I go for Return against the Golduck, knocking it out in a single hit, no problems there. The Quagsire just barely survives. It goes for Amnesia, which is not helpful, and I finish it off, so that's another free KO. Lapras then uses Blizzard, which does like a fifth, and then I finish it off. So I've made it to the Starmie. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the Starmie is faster, it goes for Confuse Ray, and then Wooper starts to hit itself, and Starmie starts to stack up damage using Surf. Its second use of the move takes Wooper all the way down to 3 hit points, and then luckily for me it snaps out of confusion so return hits. However, Starmie is quite defensive, so will it survive? And luckily for Wooper, the answer is no. From there, I quickly defeat the rest of the Kanto Gym Leaders and make it to blue. I wanted to play this fight as honorably as was possible, so I went into it with the moveset of Earthquake, Return, Amnesia, and Rest. By the way, if you're wondering how I relearned Earthquake, I used the TM from Victory Road to learn it. I figured that I would need it after Lance, because Earthquake is pretty much useless against him. Now the reason I say I wanted to win this fight honorably is because I wanted to see if Wooper could do it without Curse. However, the problem here is that Blue sends an Executor second, and Return is doing slightly less than half. That allows the Grass-type to get set up with Solar Beam and hit me once, which surprisingly only does just over half. However, Blue has two full restores, so he just heals the Executor. However, then Wooper gets a critical hit, but Blue uses another full restore, so he heals it all the way to full health, and then I don't have the damage ranges, and Executor uses Solar Beam, finishing Wooper off. Okay, so goodbye honorable strategies. By the way, in StarCraft 2 I played the Protoss race, so I am very familiar with cheese. And the strategy that I have for the final two trainers of the game is completely broken. If you didn't see my Slugma video, that's when I figured it out, but I can basically put Curse and Amnesia in combination with each other to max out my attack, defense, and special defense. This essentially makes the Pokemon I'm using a wall that has incredible attack and is just really slow. The only downside to this strategy is if the opponent gets a critical hit, when I'm either on low health or with a move that is super effective like Solar Beam, then I am going to lose. However, with Return being extremely powerful, each Pokemon is most likely only going to get one move in. The exception to that rule in the blue fight is the Rhydon. It has incredible defenses and it also resists Return. However, it just uses Fury Attack and I finish it off, so that thing's useless. After that, it's Blue's Ace, the Arcanine, 
It goes for Flamethrower, doing pathetic damage, and I finish it with Return. So let's use our final four rare candies to take Wooper all the way up to level 83, and now it is time for the ultimate test, Pokemon Trainer Red. And honestly, he is not really much of a test for Wooper. That was a lie. I was just trying to hype the battle up. This is incredibly simple because the only damage dealing move that Pikachu has against Wooper is Quick Attack. And as soon as I start setting up Curse, this move is going to do almost nothing to me. From there, I can just sweep through his entire team with a weak first stage Pokemon that has struggled everywhere else. However, ironically, it does not struggle against Red. Here, I do want to address the fact that Curse is kind of a boring move. However, it tends to be the best solution only for the last two battles, so it doesn't make the rest of the playthrough awful, like Return does. However, I've also noticed that it's not particularly useful for fully evolved Pokémon either. They tend to just have enough power to make it through Red's team with a little bit of careful planning. So, at long last, Wooper clocks in with its final time against Red. It finishes the game with a time of 2 hours, 42 minutes, and 16 seconds, with 31 resets at level 83. This took 9 hours and 31 minutes of game time. Now that I'm done with the first playthrough, I need to ask the question, how can I save time? And unfortunately for me, there aren't a lot of good mechanisms for Wooper. It has all the coverage it needs to defeat all of the opponent's Pokémon, it just doesn't have the damage ranges. And really what that means is just a little bit of foresight in when I'm training and not going into battles under-leveled. At this point I should definitely address Hidden Power, so for the second playthrough I'm just going to use Hidden Power Dark so Wooper has maximum DVs. The reason is, is that you obtain Hidden Power after Whitney, and by that point Wooper has access to Surf, Earthquake, and Ice Punch. Also on its moveset, it's going to probably take Amnesia, and Hidden Power can't really help it in any meaningful way. I briefly considered Hidden Power flying to make Chuck a bit easier, however that's not really relevant because Wooper needs to level a lot more for the League anyways, so I'm just going to beat Chuck with Raw damage. Also, I do need to mention that Hidden Power Flying is just trash. You have a 12 in your attack DV and a 13 in your defense DV, and because the HP DV is calculated using your other 4 DVs, you get 7 in your HP. Honestly, the only circumstance this move is exceptional is if you can save a lot of time on Chuck and Bruno, so a Pokemon where it is useful, for example, is Tyranitar. I will note that everyone questioned my decision if I should be using it with Tyranitar because of the DV law. And yes, I should be. I ran all of the numbers. It is so much better. Bruno is absolutely brutal if you do not have hidden power flying. Okay, so I'm done that tangent. Now let's get back to the playthrough and I'll talk about how I made Wooper's playthrough a little bit easier. First of all, after I defeat Faulkner, which I do at level 11 by the way, there is no reason to waste time training here, just fight him pretty much right away. It does get close, but I pull through. After that I head into Sprout Tower, because I want as much experience as is possible before Azalea Town. Of course, I am going to fight every trainer on my way, and I even do some grinding in Union Cave to bring Wooper all the way up to level 25 before I face Bugsy. This gives Slam a 76% chance to 3 hit, and a 45% chance to 2 hit, and I get the better rolls in this fight. By the way, it's worth noting here that after the Bugsy fight I am almost leveled up, so I had to fight one Pokémon to level up to 26 before the rival. Unfortunately for me, I am going to have to luck through this fight on some level. Level 26 gives me a speed tie against the Ghastly so I can set up one Amnesia here, and that makes Bayleaf's non-critical hit Razor Leaf's not to hit Wooper. Also at level 26, I have a 54% chance to two-shot the Bayleaf with Slam. That's assuming that it does not set up Reflect. In addition to those ranges, I still need luck because if the Bayleaf critical hits with Razor Leaf, I'm going to lose. That's what happens in the first battle. In the second fight, I take a little bit more time against the Ghastly setting up Amnesia one more time so that the Bayleaf will do slightly less damage. Because of the additional setup, it goes for Poison Powder on the first turn, and I finish it off. So overall, not a huge time loss here, I just had to invest earlier on in a lot of training. Both Whitney and Morty are completely trivial for Wooper, so let's jump ahead to Chuck. This fight is so much easier if Wooper is a higher level. At level 41 I have a guaranteed 1 hit on the Primeape, and then against the Poliwrath I have a guaranteed 2 hit. Price and Jasmine are not a problem for Wooper, but the rival in the underground definitely is. Unfortunately for me, this battle is going to require luck. I have guaranteed 1 hits on Magnemite, Haunter, and Sneasel, and I have guaranteed 2 hits on the Golbat as well as the Meganium. The Bitterberry solves Confusion on the first turn, but the Golbat is going to do chip damage, and then because I can't 1 hit the Meganium, it is going to get a Razor Leaf in, which does massive damage. I really don't like the win conditions here. I have to either crit or freeze the Golbat or the Meganium. 
Titanium. The reason I have to do this is because the following Sneasel is going to use Faint Attack, and it will likely take out Wooper because Meganium does so much damage with Razor Leaf. By the way, we can get really granular here and examine the exact damage ranges. Razor Leaf is doing 91 to 108 damage, which is 64% to 76% of Wooper's health. In combination with Golbat's Wing Attack, which does 16 to 19 damage, which is roughly 12% to 14% of Wooper's health, I would then have to survive Sneasel's Faint Attack, which does between 15 and 18 damage, which is 11% to 13% damage. Even if I make it past these three Pokemon, the Haunter is still faster and it knows Shadow Ball, so it's probably going to be a loss, I need one of the luckier scenarios to play out. What I figured is that eventually I'm going to freeze the Golbat or the Meganium. Since he's sending those two Pokemon out first, the resets are quite fast here, and it just doesn't make sense to level up. So let's examine that in detail, because I think it's worth going into. I'm sure you'll have questions like, why not just level up a few more times and then one-hit the Golbat? But honestly, that is not possible. To start getting one-hit ranges with the best possible roll, Wooper would have to be level 51. So that is roughly three and a half levels of grinding in the wild in Johto, which is going to take like 10 minutes at least. And then to guarantee the one hit on the Golbat, I would have to level all the way up to level 56. By the way, at level 56, Meganium is still going to be a two hit. And if Razor Leaf gets a critical hit, it still can knock me out. Okay, so let's go back to the playthrough footage now because I get really lucky. In my second fight, I freeze the Meganium and knock it out. And after that, the fight is completely trivial. I finish off all the rival's Pokemon and I can move on with the playthrough. Now overall, my luck was quite good there, so just remember that the finishing result that Wooper gets in this playthrough is going to be one of its better finishes, rather than one of its worst finishes. Now the biggest time save in the playthrough is coming up next, because instead of fighting the League right away, I know that I have to train. I grind up to level 65, and I do this before I face the rival in Victory Road, just to make this fight as consistent as is possible. Unfortunately for me, I only have a 9% chance to one-hit the Meganium, but I get the freeze in this fight. Either way, the following Pokemon are not actually that difficult, because I outspeed all of them except the Kadabra, but it can go for moves like Future Sight, and Psybeam isn't that good, so I actually take a perfect victory in this battle. With him out of the way, the league is simple now because I'm starting it at level 65, so I have no resets on any of the trainers here, even Karen. This brings Wooper to level 67 when I enter Lance's chamber, and now I'm going to make a small change. I'm just going to use all seven rare candies right now. The reason is, is that Wooper can finish the game at a slightly lower level because it has Curse and Amnesia, so it doesn't really need precise damage ranges against Red. And yeah, we are just going to skip all the way to that battle because everything between there is completely trivial. I set up completely on the peak uh, there's some evil stuff going on in the stats. Anyways, the Pikachu does use Charm just before it goes down, which is really annoying. I don't get the one-hit range on the Venusaur as a result. I was a little bit worried, but then it goes for Synthesis, and I just roll better damage on the next turn, finishing it off. After that, Red stands no chances unless he gets a critical hit, which is exactly what happens against the Snorlax. However, when Wooper's at full health, it survives Body Slam and finishes off his most intimidating Pokémon. I play safe using Rest against the Blastoise, knock it out, and the following Charizard out, and Wooper clocks in with a final time of 2 hours, 16 minutes, and 55 seconds, with 3 resets at level 81. This is a game time of 8 hours and 54 minutes. Alright, so unfortunately for Wooper, it is not quite able to get itself into the E tier today, which is for Pokemon under 2 hours and 15 minutes so it earns itself the first spot in the F tier. Now I do want to mention that I think there is further optimization to be had with Wooper. I could use the rare candies slightly earlier in the league to give myself an easier run throughout the rest of the league. Arriving at red one or two levels lower still won't change the outcome. However, right now I just don't have it in me to play another Wooper playthrough, so if you really want to see one because you're a huge Wooper fan, please let me know in the comments, maybe in the distant future, like a year or two from now, I can do a Wooper stream and improve its results slightly. Now over the summer, I I have done a lot of truly awful Pokemon in Crystal. It started with Ditto, we did Natu, Slugma, and now Wooper. So I think I now deserve to play the game with a much better Pokemon. So in the first week of October, as a part of my Halloween series, I am going to be doing a Pokemon Crystal playthrough with Gengar. Honestly, I am really excited to do this run, because Gengar has the second place results overall in my Pokemon Yellow tier list. So I wonder how it is going to do in Pokemon Crystal. Will it maintain its dominant performance? or will it be a lot more lackluster? Well, we'll find out in a couple weeks. 
Now before I close out, I want to mention the fact that throughout the next three months, the content is really going to ramp up. There will be a few more videos in October to celebrate Halloween month, and then in November there will be significantly more videos. And as was the case last year, I'm going to be doing daily uploads in December. But this year, I am not just going to stop on Christmas Day. I'm going to keep going all the way until New Year's Day. I think that it is going to be so much fun. Now I will admit that this is a huge undertaking. It is so much work. And I would totally understand if some of you are worried about my mental health. So before you leave a comment that says, Scott, please don't burn out, I just want to let you know that I have prepared for this all year. In January, I sat down and wrote a schedule planning every video for the entire year, and I also planned out my workflow behind the scenes so that I would be very prepared for December. I am actually so prepared that by August 29th, I had finished filming all of the first playthroughs for the remaining playthroughs of the entire year. As a result, the leftover work is actually not that intimidating. Anyways, that's all I have for you in this video. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo so you're notified whenever I post content. Also, a huge thanks to anyone who supports me on Patreon and through YouTube memberships. It really means the world to me, and it makes this content possible. However, if you don't have the financial means, don't worry. Just viewing really helps out too and leaving cheery comments also brightens my day. So thanks so much. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in the next video.